Welcome to another episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, executives, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. I'm Paul Edwards. This is my co-host, Jason Todd. And Jason, this is going to be an exciting episode. We're talking, we're chatting today with uh, my f- good friend, a fellow m- member of the uh, Men of Greatness Mastermind that I was formerly a part of, Pastor. And uh, now he's got a book coming out this year. He's been working on it for a while. And we're going we're gonna to chat about that. So let's bring on John DeCure, joining us from SoCal, my brother from another mother. Hey, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing well, man. Can't complain. I'm excited. You got a lot of things going on. I was taking a look at your website. You also do music production. I do. I do. I got a lot of stuff going on. It's, uh, I like to think of myself as like, um, I have one focus with three different ideas, right? So my only focus is purpose and vision. And I express that through music. I express that too, through our coaching business, which is where the book is coming from. And I express that through ministry. Those are the three things that that's how I do it. Well, you're kicking us off really well there because your book, My Purpose is the Solution, it sounds to me as though that wraps those three elements of how you're expressing your purpose into the world into a unified message. 100%. Um, you know, I feel like music is, a, is everything's about language for me. And I think that um, between, between all three, that's the one thing that's cohesive through all, all everything is just language, different ways to communicate that same message. And that's 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 kind of the core of who I am and how I how I actually um, present myself to the world. So that's that's kind of what I feel like I'm here for. Mm. Yeah. So John, we go back a few years now. Yes, sir. And uh, I can remember a time where this was, uh, you know, this was quite a, a hurdle for you in a lot of ways. Yeah. And uh, maybe we should start there with just a little bit of the journey, the evolution you've been on. Yes. From the point of view of, you know, what we're always trying to tell people to do, what we're always trying to re- remind people is if you have experience, uh, wisdom, knowledge, a message that you believe has the power to change the lives of even just one other person, you have a responsibility to become good at communicating that and to share mm-hmm. it. Yes. And I want to hear a little bit about the background of how you went through this long circuitous journey to get to where you are today. (laughs) Yeah, it is a journey. So I'm, so, you know, just in in full transparency. So I really want to encourage authors out there. Everybody starts differently and everybody is very different in their approaches. And so like, for me, um, I, I actually started with speaking, um, these things out. So I was doing a conference with my organization called session five, which is a co- more of a, like a coaching type of, of thing. And so I was actually speaking. And so I did five different talks, right. Um, that were all recorded. Mm-hmm. And after I recorded all five of those talks, then we, we pulled them down and I got a group of people together and we took the next, uh, I want to say two years. And we said, wait a minute, all five of these different um, conversations you were having are in the same thread of, of purpose. In particular, what my message is, um, is really based upon, um, you know, uh, in, in the Bible numbers 13, 33, which is like, you know, you know, being small in your own eyes, which makes you small in the world is basically kind of what, what that passage says. And so mm-hmm. how does that, how does my perspective affect the way I see the world? Right. And so, you know, we took about two years to flesh that out. And I did that with like five different people. So then after, you know, everybody gave their two cents, right? Um, we, we came together with a document that was from all those messages. So we transcribed them first and then we did interpretations of them. But because I have five different people, I have five different voices. <laughs> yeah. So then, so then it took, um, uh, an, another whole, uh, two years, right? Um, I found, uh, it's actually, um, uh, one of my goddaughters and, um, she was like, Hey, this is kind of everywhere. Let's just me and you do this so that it can just sound like one person. Mm -hmm. So then it evolved into another thing. Right. And then I, and then I met you, Paul, and then uh, your company even home did more. So it started off with 60 pages long. Um, and when I was done it. You know, after you and after I'm now where I'm at now, it's at 200 and, uh, 223 pages long. Nice. So, so, 
So it's like evolve uh, and uh, like figuring out ways to tell this message. And I think on the journey, what I have found is in that, in that five years, um, the book actually um, kind of also shaped me. You know, there's a, what is it? Uh, I think it's Michelangelo. He said, uh, I, I saw a rock and I was just, I was chiseling just to free what was inside of it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like the whole book process was like something that, you know, I was like kind of in this cage and in the process I was kind of set free. And so that's, that's been my journey. Um, it was long, but, but I wouldn't trade one moment or one day because yeah. now I feel like I got a definitive work that, um, that feels like, uh, my voice and it feels like where I am right now presently. Reminds me it's, of the thing that, um, the man who says the blessing will himself be blessed. Yes. 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 Sir. Sorry, Jason. I cut you off there. <laughs> Right. The visual that comes to my mind is that of a river and the many tributaries that flow into a river. I mean, specifically, you know, think about the mighty Mississippi. Yeah. It's like 2,300 miles long and the, the definitive start of the Mississippi, the furthest end of it is this small trickle. I think that flows out of Lake Atasca or something like that, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yet. You know, I don't live very far from a river that flows itself into the Mississippi and you could drown in the, my tiny river and you most certainly would drown in the Mississippi, Mississippi at certain areas. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of that process that you're going through where you started with that trickle and then you invited more tributaries into the flow. <laughs> yeah. And then as it starts to develop, you gain momentum, but it, it's a different river. Yep. Each point. Yes. And each river, each tributary stands on its own. Each river stands on its own, but they all flow to the, the Gulf of Mexico. Yes. 100%. I love that analogy. I mean, and it's funny because, you know, there were some, also some frustrating times in there. Right. And, you know, that's kind of when I met Paul, it, I was like in a, in a, in a crossroad. I had got it to a point, but I needed someone to help me to to push it. I think a lot of times, you know, like I said, everybody's different. Some people are just natural writers and that's just kind of what they do. Um, that's not necessarily my story. I'm, I'm more auditory. And so I have to like speak my stuff out even to this day well, before I write anything, I have to like, I have to talk it out. So for me, I have to express it first before I can write it. And then the, you know, from an author standpoint, then figuring out a way because I, I have certain, um, uh, I think it's called co colloquialism. I can never say that word right, but I have a certain way I talk and I want, I want the book now to translate, you know, how I talk. Yeah. Right. So then that, there's also that piece of it. Like when you're writing a book, trying to figure out, you know, between the, the boundaries of language and, and grammar and all those things. Um, but also trying to make sure you be authentic to yourself so the reader can actually feel like you're sitting there almost talking mm -hmm. to me, which would kind of like my. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, um, from the process that we went through you with you, John, and it was primarily Cody who was doing the back and forth, uh, you know, the, the, the reworking of all of that. Did you? But I remember at the time from both of you <laughs> getting some wonderful feedback that, um, you know, you were really able to let that let that voice speak and Cody was doing things the way that, you know, we've always done them, which is let, let the voice speak and then reflect it without losing respect for flow and, you know, uh, and readability and all of that. But we really, that's really what we wanted to do. I think a lot of people, uh, don't necessarily understand that, um, when you write in partnership with others, yes, uh, you, you think better about what mm -hmm. you're saying, mm -hmm. just not just you as the author, but the person helping you yes, uh, is compelled to cross-reference the way you say things. It's mm -hmm. like Jason did just now with the tributary river example. Yes. 100%. And say, you know, what's, what's a useful way of putting this? Mm -hmm. So that we don't just spew information at a reader, but we, we tell a story, we give an example, we give people a, a visual in some cases using words. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. I, I feel like the 
the whole the collaborative collaborative process is 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 so vital because after all, right? We're not, you know, the the book is my purpose is a solution. I didn't write that book just so I can read it. It's for other people, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like when you invite other people into the conversation, it like it totally like expands like the way you see it, but it also tells you how the message is landing, right? Mm-hmm. How people are understanding, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. like even, you know, I, I've seen, you know, I, I have friends that that's authored books. And so I kind of took a page out of their book. I, you know, I sat down, I sent the, the transcript to, you know, a couple of people so that I can see what kind of like, what are you feeling from this? Like, what do you see from this? And they, I mean, got, got a lot of great feedback that really helped me to get to the, to the end of this process. And I'm so excited for, for people to read it and get a chance to sit with it. It seems to me the process is a lot like sound and production of, of music because yes. you need the artist and I'm a sound, I'm a sound guy. I've done a lot of sound stuff in my time yes. and, uh, I run sound, uh, for people occasionally mm-hmm. and inevitably one of, you know, one of the musicians is like, Hey, how's it sound? What do you think about, you know, what, yeah. you know, can you up this? Can you up that? Mm-hmm. And I think the last time somebody said that to me, I said, I am confident in how this sounds. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, up on stage with an in-ear monitor, you are not qualified to counsel me on how it sounds in this what? auditorium. What? Okay. There's not. <laughs> and furthermore, you know, I'm a musician too. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm, I know your job. Yes. I know my job. Right. And, and I feel like the writing process or any creative process is very similar. Mm-hmm. We are sometimes that musician being like, Hey, I've got this thing and I think it's so amazing and wonderful. Right. But the audience isn't connecting. And there's sometimes a go between, which may be a sound person mm-hmm. saying, actually, we can enrich this. We can make it palatable. Yep. And we can take what you're giving us and make it better so that it connects with the audience or sometimes tell the musician, no, no, this is a mess. Mm-hmm. Do not play this. Don't you play know, those notes. No. Thing the way you think it is. Right. You love it and nobody else does. Yeah. That I think is, it underscores the necessity of allowing time for that message to come together, even in one's own mind, but then yeah. have it come together with other people so that, uh, so like music, you get a groove. Yes. And you know when you're in the pocket and when yeah. you're not. And it is subtle. Uh, but when you hit it, it's a completely different song. <laughs> Man, yeah. you are you are totally speaking my language. Can't tell you how many times, you know, I've been on stage, you know, on the piano. And, you know, you feel something to your point. You feel something on the stage. And depending on how how um how temp- temperamental you are as an artist that that the relationship between the stage and the and the sound uh the front of house can be are the ones doing the the stuff for the house right could be the tension sometimes can be interesting but to your point there is a place where well both parties connect that is undeniable and and everybody knows it mm-hmm. everybody on stage knows it the sound people know it and most of all, the audience, though, it's almost like there's this place where everybody meets. And I think that's what I was looking for, for this, for, with this, with this particular book. Like where, where is the place where everybody can meet? Because even with my, with my, um, with my cultural context, you know, I was processing some of the things I was writing, um, and going like, okay, is this just for, what's my audience? Is it just for these people or is it just for these people? And if it's for all people, how can I be authentic to myself, right? And still get, and, and still get everyone involved with, with the process of at least, you know, reading the information to see if it's even something that, that they even are processing in the same, mm-hmm. you know, and what are those, what are those pivotal points of, um, of, of compromise? I want to say, because I think sometimes that word gets a little bit. Um, of a negative rap, like a, you know, people say, I, I don't always think compromise is a, is a bad thing. Like where, where are those points where I can go? Okay. This, this point doesn't sacrifice my authenticity. It's just simply 
a place where I'm tweaking this so that I can speak to more people. Yeah. You know, and I think that's also important when writing books. This is what uh, we were just talking about, Jay, in one of our recent conversations that, um, you know, suppose you had an audience full of people of different genders and backgrounds and religious persuasions mm -hmm. and nationalities and, but they could all understand, you know, they all can understand English and yet there's things that you can say that, you know, 20% of the audience will understand and 80% will say, what's he talking about? Yeah. Yep. But then there are other things that you can say and a hundred percent of that room will have some frame of reference for that. Yeah. And what are those things, right? Yep. What are the things that are not unique to men versus women, young versus old, yes. one race versus another, right? Yes. What, what, what is universal? Because mm -hmm. if you've tapped into what's universal, you're tapping into the way God designed yes. the entire creation. Yes. The stuff that, the stuff that is never going to change, that's him. Yes. And so, yeah. you know, you talk about uh, a theme of overcoming adversity, mm -hmm. right? I don't care what, what stripes you wear, you are going to be overcoming adversity if you 100%. live on this planet. 100%. You yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I totally get what you mean there and, and compromise is, a, is, is one word that, that can illustrate it. But again, like you said, there's a connotation around that. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is, is be careful to acknowledge that there are differences, but also, you know, to say at the same time, there are things that, that separate us and there are things that we share. Well, yes, yes. And that's, I mean, I think that's important. Um, you know, being, being an author, uh, especially these days, right? We're in the information age and, um, and being able to be compelling also, that's another thing, right? Mm -hmm. To be compelling in your writing is also something that is not just a, a, a suggestion in these days, right? It's a must because, you know, I have a 16 year old, it's hard to get him to read because of these things, right? So yeah. it's like, um, <laughs> like the phone like that, the access to the level of technology, like there's a level of compelling that you must be in writing. So like the creative process even has to be, you know, at another level. And so I'm, that's the other reason why I'm like that collaborative piece and that, and that those seeing what all those, whatever pivots you have to make in, in your authorship is so important, you know, mm -hmm. so in my thoughts. Yeah. I think sound, this analogy with sound is pretty spot on because like, what you just talked about, how you have to write in a certain way to be compelling is very similar to a concept in, in theater that you, you play to the back of the room. Yeah. You, it, it's on stage. It feels too big. Yes. And when I've coached people with sound, it's I'd like when you're, when you feel like you're awkward, you're so big, you're awkward. You're yeah. probably hitting the front or the middle when you feel like, oh man, I've overdone it. Now you're to the back of the room. Yes. You, gotta, you gotta fall in love with the uh the feeling of what it of what it feels like to to be in that space. And that's yeah. what I that's what I'm connecting with when you're talking about uh you know writing in a certain way is to uh, so as to connect. Yeah. Um and then the other thought is you know, you're talking about uh contributions from other people and you know, we're we're thinking of gender issues, we're talking about race issues, you know, just context issues. Yeah, which, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure this will connect for, for musicians. It'll, you know, John, you know what I'm talking about that when you get a group of musicians together, uh, if you get a group of musicians who all want to be soloists, that makes a pretty awful band. Yes. Um, and like, you know, it's like the guitar player is always doing a guitar solo and he's a, like, yeah, it's like, it's like quit it. Uh, you know, or the bass lines always doing a bass solo or the drums yeah. always doing a drum solo. Everybody mm -hmm. overplays yes, yep. and it becomes a mess. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, whereas a skilled communic musician, let's say communicator mm -hmm. knows how to sometimes underplay a bit, yep. pull it back, allow mm -hmm. space yep. for who needs to take that line at that moment. And, mm -hmm. and it's interesting that when you, when you look at some of the, the, the best songs, the songs that really connect the, re, you know, re, let's say recorded songs, those, those instrumental parts are so simple 
And sometimes they're not playing anything. No. And when it comes together, it makes a fantastic song. Yeah. Well, saying, but, it, but people think that they're, they have to play all the time. You don't have to play all the time. You are, that is, this is 100% correct. I mean, man, like the analogy is so spot on, so perfect because um, that was my experience with the first writing group is, is that it, everybody was brilliant. But like literally, you know, if we're taking the transcription from something that I was, that I was saying, right. And it, that's what happened. My first manuscript had literally five different voices. Like everybody was like taking their own part, you know, like ripping. Right. And I'm like, well, wait, you know, <laughs> like, can we, can we all like, look, we need to, let's just choose a voice. And that's when I realized I had to go a different route. It had to, it had to happen differently in order for me to get to that space you know, where, where, where I was able to at least get to a place where I could even talk to Paul, like, okay, now this is a document. So that first document was just like, you know, every, like, it felt like a jam session. <laughs> which has its place. Yeah. Which, <laughs> has, it, yeah. which has its place. Right. And, and it's in particular, it has its place right at the beginning when everybody's getting to know each other or everybody's kind of like, what, what are we going to do with this thing? Let's make yeah. it ours. Yeah. Fine. Jam out. And all, yeah. uh, but it eventually has to find a groove. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and until it finds a group, it's just a mess, and yeah. it's okay to be a mess. Yes, but not, not when you're you know not okay to stay a mess. Yeah. So yeah. I'm curious. Let's let's go into that a little bit deeper. Then, okay. Then yeah. think about the relational process at yeah. play mm -hmm. when you have multiple voices involved, and you need to direct or produce in some fashion and t tell a person, you know what, we're taking your voice out. It doesn't fit. Yeah. Walk us through the process for you as you're refining this. How do you take care of the relationships in the writing process? Uh, I, you know, I, this is, I, I, I firmly believe that uh, honor takes care of most things, right? And so that first group, the reality of it is that they created the bridge for me to walk across to get to the next space, right? So I didn't have any pages before. So I, what I did was is that I had a conversation with all of them. And there was enough time that passed to where everybody kind of knew I was moving. So I kind of first communicated, let everybody know that I was, that I was actually moving to do something different. Um, but I, I, I respected their time. And as a uh, token of my appreciation, you know, um, I got everyone a gift and I gave them um, specific honor in the book. I talked about each one of them individually and how much they helped. So if people read the story, they don't just read about just my purpose and solution. They get the chance to read, you know, the story of how this whole thing came about. Yeah. So like, that's the way I dealt with it. I think there's something to be said as well, John, for, um, when there's, uh, when there is sufficient preparation or vision up front, a vision you're very familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. There is with you know with people who have the maturity to handle it there is a, a conversation around this is the vision that we're moving towards yes and what you've contributed has been valuable mm -hmm. yet it's not going to get us any further than it already has yes so yes. right either we have the ability to expand on that mm -hmm. or we have to stop here right, right not not negating anything that you've done simply acknowledging right this and sometimes right the vision isn't always clear at once and you only get to it later on <clears throat> but in either direct but in either sense if you if there's that mature open line of communication from start to finish you know over time um and i'm not saying this is much easier to talk about than to do obviously but well, i think i think that that'll carry you a long way 100%. Uh, I think that, that that's all, that's, that's very good wisdom. Like the, the, the putting the vision and talking vision throughout and letting, letting the vision be the separator, right. Yeah. Are the thing that pushes you to the next phase. So that's, that's also, yeah, that I, I would agree with that 100%. That's also something that happened, but that's the way, that's the way we got to one sound per, you know, in one sound in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Which it sounds like the process uh, that you employed and that we're talking about here 
is very similar to the topic of being uh, or living out a purpose, yes. living on purpose, finding your purpose. Well, a lot of times it's a fits and starts. It's a mess one moment and it feels oh. like it hits a groove the next. Yeah. And that process is is necessary. And I feel like so many people want to want to hurry up to get to the end to, to be like, I've arrived. But the it's actually the process, I think, which is the important part of of finding a purpose. Yep. I feel like um I had a mentor tell me that the reward is the journey. And uh, and I I have found that that's a hundred percent. That's truth a hundred percent of the time. The reward is the journey. You just don't know that until you get to the destination and you go, man, I wouldn't trade any of these things. Like when you're in it, you got the frustration, the irritation, all the things, right? Yeah. Uh, but then you get to it and you're like, man, I wouldn't trade one, one incident because if you move one experience from the process, you, you no longer have the end result. I yeah. think also the, the process is the preparation. Well, yes. And so if you short circuit the process, you short circuit the preparation. You know, Paul, I think you've been a bodybuilder before, haven't you, Paul? For a little while now. All right. So the, the process of, of going to a show for bodybuilding is intense. It's not, it's not for the faint of heart. You have to make lifestyle changes to be able to show up in that space. Yeah. You oh, the prep is, the prep is more state. fun than the show I've discovered. I, I would rather do the prep. Mm. I'm not yeah. kidding. I like, I've been on stage. Um, and, and I mean, you know, the, the photos look really cool. It's when you realize I get all of five minutes up here and oh. I walk around and do these poses and these people who don't even know me are making judgments about whether I'm better than this guy next to me. Right. And you suddenly re like it, 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 because I did it at age 39, you know, and I had some some familiarity with, I'm not trying to drag this off on a tangent. I'm just telling you the process, right. Is actually like you should like seriously dig into loving the process because yeah. the finished result is great. Don't yes. forget finished result. Once it's done, it's over and done. It's what you carry Ooh. forward into the next process you go through from, you know, oh, loving yeah. this process. That's so valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Sorry, Jason, I, I went completely off on a tangent there. No, I think it's, I think it's fine. I, I think it's valuable because in my experience, so many people want the results and they don't want the process. And mm -hmm. if you are unwilling to go through the process of, let's say, you know, the topic of your book, living on your purpose and finding your purpose and all that, that it, all of that involves, if you're unwilling to go through the process, you don't deserve and cannot handle the purpose if it came upon you. Right. Yeah. No. Oh. Agree. Agree. This is exciting. I mean, even talking about this, I know I, I wish that I would have had this to listen to before I started <laughs> because just, you know, hearing you all, you all, the analogies and just the conversation, I'm like, man, how valuable, um, how valuable would this have been if I would have heard this before I started? So this is cool. I, I appreciate you guys even doing this. This is so awesome. Well, we appreciate you too. And, and I was thinking, I find myself thinking of this so often now, uh, what you just said, Jason, right? Um, we sit there and we watch, um, you know, athletes who are at the absolute peak of performance, uh, the Tom Brady's and the Peyton Manning's of the NFL, right? And they make it look so easy. Even yeah. among the, the top players in the world, they still are head and shoulders above them and they, they make it look so easy. He just steps back and throws the ball and everything else works out. Right. Both of those guys would tell you, I, I know Manning has said this. He said, I love practice more than big games. Because mm. practice, I can do the play over and yeah. over and yeah. over and over yeah. until I can't get it wrong. Mm-hmm. Then I go on to the big game and that plays easy. I, I read the defense. It's, oh, okay, we're going this way. I'm not going to mess that up. Why? Because I know it so well. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, that's, that's the key. That's what so few people are willing to do. 100%. Um, the, I'll say this too. I think my encouragement in the process too is you got to consider the root or where you got it from. And I'm a very strong proponent of, of inspiration. And 
I personally, my, my opinion and my belief system is that inspiration is divine. It comes from God. And I think when you approach book writing, and I always say this, that writing, writing is one of, one of the fastest manifestations of God. Mm-hmm. Because you're, you're taking something that does not exist or have not been seen and you are inspired and then you take that and you put it to paper. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you're, when you're doing something like that and I bringing something that's from a, from a divine space into the world, um, the, the understanding of that makes you appreciate the process more because the enhancement and all the thing that comes along with forming the, the completion of this thing, you realize was handed to you, um, as a steward of something much greater than you. And, um, how wonderful is it to, to be able to do that? I was, I'm reading a book, um, uh, by Isabel Wilkerson right now called, uh, Cass. And mm-hmm. it kind of puts me in that mind frame, like, like I'm reading this book and it's, it's riveting. But I can feel her inspiration for it and, and all of the pain that came with what she wrote to get mm-hmm. this, to get this book to the world. And I think about that, the process of, or, or being appreciative in the process for the inspiration that come as something that doesn't necessarily just belong to me, but it was given more so for me to release it as opposed to, you know, this is mine type of thing, right? Mm. Just a thought. Maybe that was a little bit convoluted, maybe a little deep, but that's how I think it goes. Like the, the importance of authorship and writing. I, I have a close friend who went through some pretty challenging, uh, challenging things in his life. And when he was talking to me at, uh, towards the end of, you know, things, the issues had been resolved. Uh, he was recounting to me an experience that he had in a men's group mm. where a gentleman he was speaking, who was sharing that morning, uh, was saying all the things he's gone through. Right. And my friends, my friends started to speak into this other gentleman's life and say, mm-hmm. you know, here's where you're at and here's where you're headed. And I can tell you it's going to be okay. And, and so as my friend is telling me this story, he said, you know, I thought, I thought that these things that I'd gone through for the past 20 something years were going to be gone. I didn't mm-hmm. want to look at them anymore. I thought I could just push them behind me. Mm-hmm. They were done and over. I've moved past and through them. And he said, and, and in that moment, I realized that my experience and the fact that I've traveled down that path is actually not for me to just move on. That mm-hmm. might be a gift in, in and of itself, but the gift to others is the fact that I can help them walk that same journey. Yeah. And I feel like this idea of what we're talking about purpose and the process, identification of your purpose, working with other people and how it is so universal. These, these topics are so universal and portable from one experience to the next. You know, we're talking about writing. We're talking about sound. We could talk about art. We could talk about all sorts of things, movies, film. Anytime we go into this creative energy, you know, which I think is the, it, uh, you know, people could disagree with me, but I think it's a, it's a, that's also kind of the image of God, right? We get a creative energy and ability to do things yeah, uh, and, and shift the future. Yep. Um, that it necessitates us feeding one another with our experiences and then us kind of going back and going, okay, what do I do with this? How, how does, how do I shift my viewpoint? How, what, what do I need to remove? What do I need to add yeah. so that I can attend to my journey, mm-hmm. but also attend to this guy's journey when he needs. Me. Yep. I feel like it's the, a big to do. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I 100% agree. It's like you get, you get an experience that like even the essence of this podcast, right. Is, is based on people's experience. And now you, you're, you're armed with all of the like answers, if you will, right? You have a, everybody has different sets of answers and to be able to release those and give those to people so that they can actually, um, avoid some of your pitfalls, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and then come up with their own, like, and then they'll get a set of tools for the for someone else. And it's just kind of, 
I feel like it's an elevation with, with each, with each thing. So the thing that happened with your friend, I think is, is definitely a portion of our process as authors is like, you know, you learn and you, and you give that information so that the next writer doesn't have to go through what you want. And I was thinking, uh, John, as you mentioned, <clears throat> as we're winding down here, but I was thinking of, uh, your comment that, um, writing is is one of the quickest ways we imitate god because we're taking something ethereal and abstract and through the power of the tongue or the power of the written word in this case we're making spelling out a reality yes and it took me back to this uh, this quote from <clears throat> moshe chaim luzado who was a 16th century rabbi and he said uh, language determines reality everything else is mere convention wow and of course, then you immediately have to face the fact that the three of us on this podcast all exist because of a conversation. Yes. That began usually on the part of our father talking to our mother, mm -hmm. which led to marriage, which led to our birth. Yeah. But at some point we all began with words. Yeah. Long well, before we, we had physical bodies, right? Well, if we can end this on a good joke, I saw a meme. And this, this kid's talking to his mom and says, mommy, did you want me? And she looks back at him and says, uh, you, I wanted the back rub. <laughs> All right. Well, I think about getting more than you bargained for. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, your book, My Purpose is uh, the Solution, where people can go to johndecure.com to find out more about you. Yeah. Uh, give us some give us some words of wisdom to authors who are embarking on this journey uh, of writing their own books. Uh, this is what I would say, you know, is don't give up. And even when you get into the, to the lows, um, are what we call writer's block or there, there are, there are ways and connections that you can make that will spark inspiration again. And so I would say find the whales of inspiration would be the thing I would say mm -hmm. and, and figure out what those are for you. Um, what people are those, like what, what environments are those? And once you find the whales of inspiration, Make sure you go there so that you can keep going. I love that visual. Well, John, thanks so much for joining us on the Emissary Authors Podcast. This has been a great, uh, great conversation, very meaningful to my life. Uh, thanks for joining me. And no, I, I appreciate you. I almost want to go back to my book and put all the your analogies in there because they fit part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate you both always good to be with you my friend and uh, thanks for joining us for this episode of the emissary authors podcast where we help faith-driven founders ceos and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter my name is paul edwards this is my co-host jason todd we've been chatting with john de cure and we will see you next time ready <laughs>